people, I know this is like talking about Judaism or religion, but uh, whoever's listening out there, children are so precious. Oh, God, they're precious. It's the first thing. It's priority one. You know, forget your church, your mosque, your hogan. You know, forget it all. There's nothing in the world that matters more than a child. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Should I say it again? Nothing. <laughs> uh, if we can't take care and tend to our children, we shouldn't bother praying to God. Because we are all God's children. How can we stand before God and pray for our needs and for God to love us and carry us through hard times and take care of us if we don't do the same to our kids? You know, oh, it's just unbelievable. It's such an experience. Uh, it's a prayer. For me, when I spend my time with my child, you know, every morning and every night, and sometimes in the middle of the day, <laughs> I feel that this is a prayer. The act of taking care of children is a prayer. I am praying in that moment. Because what is prayer? Prayer is, you know, uh, acknowledging the Creator and, and, and sharing with the Creator what it is that, that you need in your life. And, you know, could you please spare a dime, God, you know, give me a new bike or something, or a better cable for my TV, you know, whatever it is we might be asking for. Um, and while you are taking care of a child, if you do it consciously, it's like a prayer. It's like, uh, uh, for example, so I'm with her and she's about to do something that's kind of dangerous, climbing the rocks, you know, and I'm kind of behind her, not touching her or, or carrying her or fixing things for her, but like being there to catch her in case she falls. And in that moment, I become aware that 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 is what I want from my Creator. It's, it's like a prayer. In that moment that I become aware of what I'm doing to my child, I, I send that awareness to God, you know, as a prayer. You know, may this be the way that, that you are with me and with the world, that you always stand behind us, ready to catch us. We don't always feel your presence and you're hovering over us, but we don't want that either all the time, do we? We want free will want to try to climb that rock and test our skill. We want to find our own power. And in that process, I feel it's a prayer. I'm asking God to be with me as I am being with my child. You know? And if I I'm, if I'm suddenly get really like uh, upset about something my kid is doing, you know? So, uh, in that moment, I can either say, hey, stop that, don't do that, hey, you're not supposed to do that, hey, don't do that, don't do that, do do Thou shalt not. Or I can say, mm, pull back. Speak gently with the child. Find a way to admonish the child in a way that the child will not feel slighted, will not feel shrunken, will not feel disempowered and torn to shreds. We got to be really careful how we talk to our kids. Otherwise, Mida Kenega Mida, like the second century Rabbi Yehuda said, which literally means uh, measure for measure. Or Bader She Adan Modet, he said, Modidino So, which means by the standards by which you relate to others is the standards by which you will experience God relating to you. So when you are with your children, doing things with them and, and just being with them and how you are with them is a prayer how you want God to be with you. Because you are God's child, God is your parent, God is parenting you, and you're parenting this child. One mirrors the other. Children, number one. You know, and the problem is, you look around the world and you read all these sad articles and stories about how people are with kids, adults, <coughs> so-called parents, treat their kids knock them down, abuse them physically, uh, you know, beat them, spare the rod, spoil the child. You know, another one of the many mistranslations, blatant mistranslations of the Hebrew scriptures. You know, the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, for example, it doesn't say rod. 
It says shepherd's crook. Shevet, Musar, it says, which is, Shevet means a shepherd's crook, shepherd's staff, and Musar means uh, transmission, transmitting a teaching, education. But the King James Version has it as rod, so everybody goes around beating the hell out of their kids. I raised sheep for a long time, and, and people around me, we lived on sheep farms in West Virginia, before we moved to New Mexico, never have I ever seen a shepherd hit his sheep with a, with a shepherd's rod, with a shepherd's staff. The shepherd's staff, the purpose of it is, that's why it's very long, is to guide the sheep. It is when the sheep are walking this way, uh, you put the staff down, you know, like this, you put the stick across them so it's like a fence and then they walk the other way. They walk away from where they're not supposed to go. That's the idea of it and that's what the intention of it is because that's what Jewish theology teaches. It says one is forbidden to hit their child. It says if you have to admonish a child, a shoelace will do. <laughs> uh, in fact, in Jewish law, in the ancient Jewish law, uh, and the code of Jewish law in the Middle Ages continued that codification. If you um, hit your child and bruised them, you know, if you hit your child and wounded them, you had to, you were liable for all the uh, criminal liabilities as if you would have hit and wounded a stranger. They're not yours to beat up. They're yours to tend. They're yours to take care of. As a parent, they're not, they don't belong to you. They're a picadon, as the Talmud puts it, which means uh, something that has been given into your care. It's like somebody comes to you, your friend comes to you and says, uh, could you watch my, my dog while I'm gone? Oh, we take such good care of the dog. It's not mine. You know. Feed it, we take it to the bed, or whatever. We take it for a walk and pick up the, the crap behind it. But our own kids, they're a picadon. God came to our house and said, could you please take care of this soul and nurture it to fruition? I'll be right back. See? And what do we do? We treat it like it's our own. We, are, we neglect, we don't pay enough attention, we don't talk to it right, and so on and so forth. There are many laws in our tradition about the responsibility a person has to a pecadon, to someone else's uh, something, someone else's property that they have trusted into your hands for safekeeping. A child is one of those things. We got to really take care of it. It doesn't belong to us. It's a soul that has been embodied in us and given into our care and our trust. And we have to treat it that way. It's not my kid. <laughs> I remember in Israel, in Jerusalem, I was driving, riding on a bus. <laughs> Those of you who've been in Israel know what it's like riding on a bus. <laughs> and um, there was a woman who on her way off the bus was yelling at her kid, because her kid was, you know, three-year-old sometimes get into these uh, daytime night terrors, <laughs> where they just like lose it. Uh, she didn't want to get off the bus right away, or the way her mother yanked her, whatever. She lost it, and she was crying and screaming and refused to move, and the mother was yelling at her and started to hit her. And one of the passengers, you know, a guy in the back, yelled, Hey, don't do that to that child. To which the mother then turned and responded, It's my kid. You mind your own business. To which the guy replied, It's all that child is, belongs to all of us. See, that's the kind of responsibility we need. And that leads me to Judaism in relationship to the earth. Because that's exactly how we have to be with the earth, too. You know? <laughs> it says uh, in the book of Genesis, and the Creator placed the earth being, which is literally what the Hebrew, what we translate as man, <laughs> the man. <laughs> Where did we get this from? Who translated this stuff into English back then? The man. Put the man and the woman in the garden. 
Adam does not mean man. Adam means earth being. Adam comes from the word Adama. Adama means earth. And the Adam is the being of the earth. And what is translated as woman literally is Isha in Hebrew, literally means fire being or fire. Or it's a she fire. Ish, ish is fire. Isha is she fire. <laughs> a woman of fire. Fire woman or fire being. It's in the feminine. Gosh, we've got to retranslate that thing. See, people who know Hebrew uh, don't have these the, the same picture of the Hebrew scriptures as those who only study it in English. You can't translate a French poem, for example, into English and get the same uh, intention of the writer. You can't translate the Hebrew scriptures into another language and get the feel of the theology that gave birth to it or was born out of it. So people walk around uh, with our Bible justifying all kinds of sick things that was never intended and that is totally antithetical to everything the scriptures represented, to what brought the scriptures into being and what was born out of it. That's sad. It's tragic. And probably the most, the greatest victim of, of the Bible is the people of the Bible. We were victimized because people who, who started their own religions from our Bible persecuted us relentlessly for 1,800 years. They still are in some countries because they read our Bible in such a way that they could deride us because as long as we exist, we're a threat. They're supposed to be the next step. We should have been gone long ago. We're rejected by God. God, if this is rejection, I love it. The earth is so much more than just a physical thing upon which we live while we sojourn and do our spiritual journey. The earth, in our tradition, is not something you use. Abraham Joshua Heschel, a great rabbi who died about 15 years ago, uh, he used to talk about how our civilization, our, our, our Western culture, I should say European culture, uh, this is the West, <laughs> the Western culture that was dominated by the European culture later. Anyway, this, this culture we live in here in America, for example, is one which perceives nature as a toolbox. It's a toolbox. So chopping down trees like, uh, you know, they're just things to use. We raise our cows and, and, and just assembly lines, slaughter, you know, it's, it's no big deal. Everything that is on the earth is for us to use. As we treat the earth and its creations, and as we think about it, the way we think about it, is the same way that we become. We become that. So, if we think of the earth as a toolbox, we become tools. So the people who see earth and everything as just something to use end up in their lives, if you observe it, using other people, using people in relationships, right? So there are men uh, who get married, go out on a date, fall in love, get married, then use their wives the rest of their lives, see? It's, it's, it's a user society, you know? The women are the slaves for sex, for uh, taking care of the laundry, taking care of the kids, and there's a lot of domestic violence and abuse because it's somebody to vent your rage on. Because this is what it is. We're using. We're users. Takers and users. <laughs> that's the mindset that prevails today, and that's destroying our planet and each other. You know, we talk about destroying the planet. We're destroying each other in the same way. We use other countries. Other countries use each other. Uh, dictators use their people. It's all about using so that you, you know, just for your own purposes. We're not here to use, we're here to garden. Just like I spoke about parents and children. 
We're supposed to guard in the world. We're stewards. Um, and that's what it says. It says uh, to God placed the earth being into the garden, the earth, to work it. Well, actually, you can translate the word avda also to serve it. <laughs> it, it. It literally means also to serve, to serve or to work, to work in the way of serve. Um, like malacha means work, like toiling, labor, labor. Uh, avoda connotes service, like avodas Adonai, service of God. So place them in the earth to serve the earth. You know, we're the waiters. <laughs> the earth gives us tips. But if we don't treat it right, we're not going to get any tips. If we don't treat her right, then Midrash says, there's no one else around that's going to fix it for us later. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who lived in the uh, latter part of the first century, early part of the second century, um, he was a great mystic. Um, most of his mysticism evolved while he was hidden in a cave for 13 years with his son, because the Romans were after him. They had martyred many rabbis. Jesus had been only one of them, not the only one. And uh, Shimon Bar Yochai and his son Rabbi Eliezer hid in a cave for 13 years until it was safe to come out. The teacher, the rabbis were very dangerous to the Romans because to the status quo of the society because simply, you know, they inspired the people, they empowered the people, which in turn uh, made the people think that they were worthy and therefore why be conquered by this Rome thing? And led to a lot of rebellions against Rome and the rabbis were blamed for it all the time because they were the ones who went around rabble-rousing the people that they counted, that God cared about them, that they owed no allegiance to anybody. So, lots of them were martyred in worse ways than we have heard of. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai taught the following. He said, one who pays no attention to the physical uh, reality of the earth, the trees, the minerals, plants, the animals, has no way of reaching God. Because the Creator here, he says, is concealed within creation. Nothing exists, he taught, without the Creator willing it to be. Every plant, he said, has a little spirit assigned to it, telling it to grow. It's like a finhorn. <laughs> Every tree, Every blade of grass, he says, has a spirit attached to it. A spirit which is a manifestation of the divine will that it exists. A living spirit being, nurturing it into existence. Rain falls, he says, not just because people need it for their fields. We thank God, oh, thank you for making it rain so my garden can grow. Oh, thank you, you take such good care of me. Meanwhile, God is going, huh? I didn't do it for you. I did it for a little blade of grass in Afghanistan that was drying up. And that's a teaching of the Zohar, the book of the Zohar. At a theater near you. This is one of eight volumes of the Zohar, one of the oldest of the mystical texts of my people. One of them. There are many others. And most of them are still in manuscript form. Stolen, robbed from our people over the centuries, and sitting in the Vatican, or museums in Oxford, Munich. We're able, they allow us every now and then to come and take pictures. Uh, the Hebrew University Library, I think, has most of them already in microfilm. That they had to go to the Vatican, and to Munich, and to Oxford libraries, and take pictures of these very ancient manuscripts that had been taken from our people thousands of years ago by the conquerors, the conquerors, 
the takers, the users. So the Zohar teaches that this world that we use, our toolbox, is so sacred that it is the way through which we become spiritual, is through the physical. It's Aramaic for the Zohar, for the Creator um, look, the Creator took what we today in different paths see as, as spiritual enlightenment and created the universe, which means that the world, the earth, for example, is divine inspiration, not just the Bible. <laughs> so, what we call the Word of God, or the Word of God in any tradition, Bible and no Bible, the Zohar teaches that just as the Word of God is, could be the Word of some uh, person who comes back from a vision quest, or some person that comes down a mountain with, a, with some scriptures, the Word of God is equally the very earth upon which we move and sit. This is the Word of God, not just this. This is the Word of God. The plants are the Word of God. The trees are the Word of God. The mountains are the Word of God. Ki hu amar hu As it says in the book of Psalms, for the Creator uh, spoke and it came into being. That's the divine word. <laughs> God said, let there be creepy crawlies, let there be horses and buffalo. And there was. So that means that horses and buffalo are the divine word. So those who go around sitting, holding their Bibles, well, I'll hold the real Bible. This is one of the five books of Moses in Hebrew. Uh, people go around holding their Bibles saying, This is the Word of God! <laughs> Makes me laugh so much. Uh, because they're, it's like, it's like um, 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 my little brother, my older brother, I'm sorry. But he used to be younger than I was, and he grew older than I was. Um, my other brother Michael, who lives in Israel, when he was a little boy, my mother took him to the zoo in Denmark where we grew up, and to show him the elephant. Isn't that exciting for a mom to, it's the first time I'm going to show my child a real live elephant. <laughs> and so they came and they stood before the elephant, and my mother said, look, Michal, Look at the elephant! Look! And my brother was going, There was a little sparrow on the ground there. Look at the little, 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 little birdie! Couldn't see the elephant at all. Got caught by the little bird. This is the word of God! It's not the word of God, it's a little sparrow in front of the elephant that you're supposed to be looking at. <laughs> this is not the Word of God. This is one of the words of God. This is another Word of God. This is another Word of God. Everything is the Word of God, or it wouldn't be here. Get it? If it's here, it's the Word of God. Each one of you is the Word of God. You are the Word of God. <laughs> The fact that you exist is because God said, let there be you and you was. See? Everything is the word of God. Everything is sacred. The earth is so beautiful. The earth is so sacred. The Talmud says that, that, um, um, which means all the trees speak to one another. It's alive out there. It's not just there for people to use. It's alive. And that's why we have very complex rituals in our tradition, and, and you find it in other traditions too, of um, the more primitive peoples. Where when they take something of the earth, there's a ritual that, that there's a consciousness that you put into it. You don't just yank it out of the earth. When, 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 we, um, uh, when we take the life of an animal, to eat meat. Those of us who eat meat, we don't just kill an animal, go out and hunt, kill, and, and then cut it up and cook it and eat it. 
There's a ritual. It's called shechita. It's ritual slaughter. It's called where you were. First of all, you cannot. The animal is not allowed to be in any kind of discomfort through the whole process, or otherwise it's not kosher. See, kosher. The word kosher. Some people think it's the rabbi that blesses it. <laughs> Rabbis have no power. We just teach. We don't know how to bless nothing. You can bless me just as much as I can bless you. A horse can bless me far better than I can bless anybody. That's a horse blessing. I've been blessed by many horses in my life. Nah. Kosher, and the word kosher literally means, it's a Hebrew word, and it means uh, preparing, preparation of release. Preparation of release. And the opposite of kosher, which is treif, like some food is not kosher, we call it treif. Treif is Hebrew for ripped. So when you want to eat meat and you um, find an animal that's willing to do that for you, you have to go through a ritual whereby you release, you prepare the animal for the release of its spirit. Otherwise, it's called ripped. You are not allowed to eat, we are not allowed to eat of an animal whose spirit was ripped from it violently. Only from an animal who was prepared, went through the ritual of preparing it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of complex laws of life has to be sharpened between each animal. It's not like an assembly line slaughterhouse thing. And if there are a slaughterhouses that call themselves kosher slaughterhouses and they do assembly line stuff, it's not kosher. I don't care what it says on the label. That's not our way. That's not the way of our people. And it, it was, and you know, you. It was something you raised, it was your, a sheep or a cow that you raised, and you prepared it for the release of its spirit in a gentle way. You spoke to it, you said some prayers, and you used the, a knife that had been investigated and, and checked and everything. It's a complex body of law that takes up several volumes of how to release the spirit of an animal the right way. If there's a nick, forget it. Totally painless, instant release, or it's not kosher, it's treif, it's ripped. Everything we eat, I know it's yucky too, but I'm just giving this example <laughs> for those of you who are meaters. That it's not about taking and ripping. It's about being conscious of the gift of what this is. When we eat vegetables, for example, you know, everything we eat, we say a prayer over it. We connect it back to its very source roots. You know, if I take um, a cabbage, you know, I don't just take the cabbage and rip it out of the ground and eat it, but I take the cabbage and I say, Source of blessing, are you creator of the universes? Who has created the mystery? Uh, all right. Because vegetable is not just a green thing that comes out and tastes good and gives you lots of vitamins. Vegetables is the mystery of the earth. That which comes from the earth is called in our tradition the mysteries of the earth. Because uh, we don't, we don't um, assume to know why things are the way they are. It's a mystery. We skip the process. We just say, this is a mystery. Look at that. Isn't that marvelous? You don't get scientific about it and say, well, it was all natural. Uh, you know, cow pie was laying there for a while in the sun and then rain and, and all that stuff and the climate and springtime and then the thing came out. Was a seed in there or something, you know? And you can just explain the whole phenomenon scientifically. But we get into the consciousness of the magic of it into the shamanic consciousness of, of things shifting, the earth changing its form, becoming cabbage. From earth you get cabbage. You ever think about that? Take this little obscure, ugly looking seed and you put it inside this, this brown, silly looking pile of dust. 
And then you pour water on it, <laughs> and a little sunshine, and, and hope for rain, you know. And then sometime in the year, it just starts to come out. It's magic. So all the prayers about these things in my tradition are about the magic of it, the mystery of it, the awe, the wonder. And, and all of our, our teachers, at least in ancient times, and some of them today, got their inspiration in the wilderness. What do you think? Moses went to some rabbinical school in Chicago. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they lived in Brooklyn and Miami. No, they got their inspiration in the wilderness. They lived in the wilderness. They lived in the wilds. And they got their inspiration from the rock and the mountains and the cactus and the birds that flew over them and the animals that went by in the night and in the day. That's where they got the inspiration. They got the inspiration from the Word of God that did not come to them through books, but they came to them through sound, smell, sight, and the environment, what we call nature. They got their inspiration because instead of observing nature, they became nature and allowed nature to become them. They allowed the Word of God, which was the creation, to imbue them. attention to you. Oh God, thank you. Oh. oh, the tea of tension. Sort of like, um, the, the Talmud says, um, Biasoro ma'amoros nidra ha'olam. With ten utterances was the earth created. Right in the book of Genesis. God said, let there be, 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 ten times. Actually, nine times. The, the tenth one is like, before there was even something for there to be. So they count that as ten. The, the nothingness is part of the something, because the something comes from the nothing. Got it? Good. Then the ancient teachers asked the following question. Could God, who could do anything, not have created the world with just one utterance? Let there be a world with all kinds of creatures finished. Why all that? I mean, the question, if you want to really understand the question, is something we probably, some of you might have asked along life's journey sometime, like, um, if, if God created, I mean, if God is like, can do anything, you know, um, why am I created like this? <laughs> Why do I have all this junk in my body? Kidneys and bold esophagus and and, 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 and colons and, and God, all this stuff and red corpuscles, white blood corpuscles and ligaments and sinews and capillaries. My God, I'm so full of stuff. You know, I got more junk in me than a car. I mean, if God... Couldn't God just have made me real simple, like styrofoam, mattress stuffing, <laughs> you know, something simple so that if something went wrong, I just went, you know, to a tailor or something or to a mattress company and they put some different stuffing in me and some new springs. My God, all this stuff that we have, I mean, we haven't even begun to fathom the, the purpose of all these things. You know, the appendix and all this junk in us. We're walking around with so much stuff in us. You ever look at the inside of the human body? It's incredible what's in there. Avenues and avenues of ligaments. And it's just endless. It's a universe in there. Why? If everything that is most important is only about transcendence and spirituality and all that stuff, not the earth and the physical, that's yucky pooey, these are just a vehicle of our soul and all that crap, then why are we so complexly built? Why did the Creator 
who is more spirit than any spirituality, uh, spends so much detail and complexity in the physical. And look at anything in the physical world. Look at a cell, for heaven's sake. Look at a dog. Look at a parrot. <laughs> look at the feathers of a bird. You ever examine the feather of a bird and the magnificence there is a color, the detail. Of, my God, six days to create this by it took God billions of years, exactly billions of years. <laughs> I get everything just right. Oh, shoot. There's these little purple right there. It's amazing. Insects, the, the myriads of species of insects that are bound and, and, and creepy crawlies on the, on, the, on the floor of the ocean. It's just amazing what God's imagination was capable of. Why all that detail? Why not just a bunch of, you know, a vehicle for the soul? Fine, just find something, uh, you know, a body, okay, here's a shell. Something simple, like a, like a cicada shell. But all this stuff, and all that stuff around us, and color, and, and mountains, and, 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 and the way the mountains are shaped. But not only that, okay, so science explains, oh, the mountains were shaped by the wind doing this way, and the water coming that way, and, and, so on and so forth, but why do I love it so much? Can they explain that? Can they explain why, why thousands and why millions of people go each year to the Grand Canyon? <laughs> like it was some kind of shrine? The answer is because it is a shrine. Because it's very sacred. It's very, very sacred. And the answer is that's mystery. And the answer is that's because something that is soul and spirit within us is drawn to the mystery of what mountain is. Because mountain is our teacher. Because the shape of a mesa that draws us out to Arizona is our teacher. Speaks to something in us that is spiritual, which means that that mesa is spiritual. In the book of Genesis, the story of our ancestor Jacob wandering by himself through the wilderness on his way to his uncle Laban. So it says he, uh, he camped out. So it says, uh, He took from the stones of the place. And he put them around his head. Or in the way they have it in the English translations, he put them under his head as a pillow. Come on, this is my ancestor you're talking about. He wasn't some kind of stupid jerk. He's, go he's going out in the wilderness for a long hike and he's camping out. He's going to put his head on rocks. A bed of nails would have been more comfortable than that. So again, literally in the Hebrew, it doesn't say he put his head on the rocks. It says, by Yosem Merashosa, which means he put the rocks around his head. And that's when he had this dream of the ladder going up to the sky from earth and spirit beings going up and spirit beings coming down. He had a vision quest. What did he do to bring himself to that vision quest? He placed these rocks around him, his head because he understood that these are his teachers. These are his teachers. These are the, the very um, uh, means by which he can get his divine inspiration. You want to hear the word of God? This is somebody else's hearing of the word of God. If you want to hear the word of God, you have to do the same thing they did. You have to go out into the earth, into the mother, into the womb. You have to go out into the wilderness. And you have to just be there and not identify anything. You have to place the rocks around your head. You have to surround yourself by what is this earth, by the mystery of it, and allow it to teach you in its own language. It says in the book of Psalms, it has no words, uh, has no voice, it cannot be heard, it can only be experienced. In fact, the Hebrew word for wilderness um, is mitbar, which is also literally the word.
word for speaking. Medaber, spelled exact the same way. Midbar Medaber. Midaber means that which speaks. Midbar means wilderness, or that which speaks. So where did they go to hear the word of God? The ones who brought us the word of God in our tradition. To the place that speaks. <laughs> did they go to some lecture? Did they go to a Judaic studies class? Did they go to the greatest synagogue in Holland? They went to the wilderness because that's where we come from. We, the Midrash, the teachings, the oral teachings of our people of many thousands of years ago, teaches that when the Creator created the human being, the Creator took lumps of clay from all four directions, all four corners of the world, all around the world, and then formed the first human being from all the earth. Which is why we all can feel at home and be drawn to any place on the earth. You know, I'm drawn to New Mexico. Uh, I'm also drawn to West Virginia, where I used to live. Um, I'm drawn, I love the mountains. I love the desert. I love the trees. I love places that have no trees. Sometimes I even love Kansas. <laughs> you know? I am comprised of the entire earth. I am an Adam. Adam means earth being. My home is everywhere. It is the culture of the users and the takers that has transformed our world into a, a globe that has been compartmentalized. You know, this state, that state, this country, that country. But if you do away with all that and just look at the planet the way we got that picture from the moon, you know, there's no boundaries. <laughs> it's just one beautiful, whirling, dynamic circle just floating in the sky like a balloon. And we're not even visible. Because the Earth is not a part of us. We are a part of the Earth. Um, in the 1700s, two litigants came before Rabbi Yisroel Baal Shem, great Kabbalist who lived in the Carpathian Mountains. He lived in the mountains. He wasn't a city rabbi. And the litigation was about um, a piece of land. <clears throat> One guy said, <clears throat> this land is mine. And the other guy said, no, that, that piece of land is mine. I have a deed and everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Rabbi Yisrael listened to this one, to his case, and he listened to this one, his case. And then he said to them both, listen, I've heard your case and I've heard your case, but I haven't heard the earth. Let me ask the earth to tell me its side of the story. They looked at each other, a <laughs> crazy rabbi. <laughs> What's the earth got to do? It's just a piece of land, you know? Land is dead, it's nothing, it has no life. We're humans! My land! My land! My land! My land! My land! Right? So Rabbi Yisrael got down on his knees and he put his ears to the earth and he, and he lay there for a long time, uh -huh, nodding, <laughs> nodding, nodding. And then he got up and he said to them, my brothers, <sighs> the earth seems to feel that it belongs to neither of you, but that on the contrary, you both belong to her. Got to take care of our earth. We're gardeners, you know. It's a great responsibility. Uh, it's precious. It's it's not the impediment to our spiritual evolution. It is the very means to it. Without it, we can't get anywhere. We were put here, and we were made in these bodies, and we were put amongst these mountains, and and this environment which means that this is where our soul can grow. And how we deal with our environment, therefore, and our bodies, and our senses, with these gifts and these mysteries, 
will largely affect whether we evolve spiritually or not. So the more pavement we put over the earth, the more pavement we put over our souls. The more um, disregard we have to our environment, the more disregard we have to our spiritual selves. You can't do both. You can't go out and arbitrarily knock down trees just because you want to make a lot of money and then go to a spiritual development seminar. I mean, you can if you want to, <laughs> you know, but uh, it won't do you any good. Because what you do with your kid is what God does with you. It's like a prayer. And what you do with the earth that God gave you to take care of is what happens to you inside. Your relationship with your body and the earth is a mirror of your relationship with your deep inner self, with your soul. Your soul is here on a journey. So is the earth, not as your tool, but as your guide. Oh, yeah.